G'day, I'm Alana Pierce, and this podcast and every other podcast that I make is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon. Patreon actually got the entire last episode of the show, which was not posted publicly due to a couple of audio issues. In an edit, free versions of this episode. If you enjoy the show... It's edit free, Rob. And <sighs> edit free, he'll read anything you say. <clears throat> and an edit free version of this episode... If you enjoy the show, consider supporting at the link in the description. See it. How do you say goodbye in Australia? Um, you can't say good day. I don't know that there is a good day. Um, all right. Tiru, you <laughs> Anyway, usually we intro the show when we have guests. Hi, everyone. I'm Alana. That's Austin. This is Rahul. And that's just... Andy over there. Uh, From my angle, let's go. I'm pretty sure you pointed into Rahul's lap and said, that's Austin. That's and Austin. I'm, I'm going to take it. I'm going to go with it. That's Austin right there. <laughs> hey, how you I'm doing, my, I'm, I'm in my happy place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we asked Rahul and Andy to come on Play, Watch, Listen today uh, because the strikes are over. We're allowed to talk about a little show they both worked on called The Fall of the House of Usher, which came out a month ago? October 12th? It's been a minute. Yeah. Not being yeah. allowed to talk about it. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Rahul plays Napoleon Usher. Andy, uh, along with his fellow composer, make up the two Newton brothers, was a composer on the show. I'm actually the third Newton brother now. Oh. Yeah. We're, the, we're the Newton triplets. Newton brothers is now. Yeah. Yeah, That's we're hitting sick. the road. Yeah, we're, we're hitting, we're hitting the road. I do. I rap over them music, and then Mike cuts it all out, so Definitely. it just becomes. It goes back to being just a score. Well, you get it in there eventually. Yeah, one day. Um, Austin, I, I like that you had to one up it. I like how you had to one up it to triplets. <laughs> it's not brothers. You you're just gonna let us simmer on that one. The new yep. trips. Born with it. Born within minutes of each other, and you know, very obviously so. Well, Andy, aren't you like actually not even brothers? Nice. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're not even brothers. Yeah, where did Newton brothers come from? We just we made it up because we had like separate jobs like a long time ago when we started this. We had separate jobs to actually pay for our gear because we weren't getting paid enough to make a living. Mm -hmm. And the people we were working for didn't want to know we were working on other things. So we were like, let's come up with a name that has nothing to do with who we are. Um, huh. and we came up with the Newton brothers, and then we just Honestly, we're just too lazy to have changed it, so we just kept it. Uh, but it's but all Taylor, me. what's Taylor's name? Full name? Taylor Newton. Taylor. So Taylor's middle name is Newton. Yeah. So that okay. was right. We had like a list of all these names. Like one of our ideas was like uh, we had these techie name ideas, and we were like, ah, we don't want to be like too ridiculous. And we were like, this is pretty like right in the middle of the road. Like you know. We could score Fight Club 2 or Legends of the Fall 2, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Which are actually cool both uh, both featuring uh, Brad Pitt in a very uh, uh, similar role. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good uh, pull. Austin, what's, That's your, a... what's your Newton brother? I feel like you, you just go by Austin Wintery. Boring. I know. It's pretty bad. I, uh, I, like, I like the intrinsically confusing nature of the moniker of Newton brothers. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like there's only one other... There's like Tom and Andy, um, which I'm pretty sure are not named Tom and Andy. Um, what is that like and, another composing duo? It's like, yeah, they, they were pretty big, maybe 20 to 10, 20 through 10 years. I, I imagine they're still around. I don't even know who they are. As far as I know, it's not even two people. Um, um, but it's like a credited, a lot of horror films. Uh, hmm. Oh, um that um they... andy, are you familiar with tom and andy yeah i actually yeah i it, it there is a tom and an andy and they, it was actually uh to your point austin it is really great marketing because like they had the whole thing it's like tom and andy is all like one word uh yeah there's oh, no spaces cool. it's like yeah. that game company yeah 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 and it's kind of like uh you don't really know you know what's going on in a good way it's 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 good it works it's a very rare composer partnerships are generally fairly rare um and yeah, well, why slash how did oh, you become part Hans of the Zimmer and uh Nate Newton Ta Howard did the begins yeah James Newton Howard James Newton Howard yeah yeah I love that yeah. they both know that it's like <laughs> oh I would never but imagine. they're not they're they're like buddies that thought it'd be fun to work together mm -hmm. that's not 
that's why is, distinctly why is it different. Not common? I mean, I, I Austin probably has a good. I mean, I would say from being in it for a while, it's tricky because things get like really at a certain point, you have to make decisions like creative mm -hmm. decisions. And if you're not, if you're not jiving with the other person a thousand percent, which in life, are we ever jiving with anyone a thousand percent? No. And it gets tricky. So you, it's, it's constant sort of uh dialogue and discussing, mm -hmm. you know, from the, the most basic thing of like, there's a main title piece of music and sometimes there's five pieces of music or two pieces of music or sometimes it's just one and you just land it but then you get into the discussion of like which one or you know which one is the one to present or are we going to mm. present all five or um and taylor and i have kind of used the the good part of it for like presentations right for like first playbacks Mm. I I sort of feel like I don't know he does like no one really knows at first you have an idea I think and so we'll present like lots of ideas that are often different sometimes I'll disagree with Taylor and he'll disagree with me but we'll just say like you know what let's let's play it for Mike and let Mike decide what what like he and Trevor think in this case um and I and sometimes that just sort of works its its way out I don't know. What do you what do you think, Austin? Because I know you've you've collaborated with a bunch of people. I have, but it's always been like a situation where the powers that be have kind of independently hired me and someone else. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's far more common in games than in film because I think there's a lot of perception of it's just too big for one person to do, which I don't think is actually a correct a judgment but it is often that's the justification or there have been situations where they go this person writes great melodies but this person does cool weird creepy textures so and we want both and of course they underestimate that probably both people can do both but it is often the like i've definitely been hired before where it was you know you're the that you're the guy to do this and you're the guy to do that and then of course as soon as you get your hands dirty everybody's doing everything so the whole it's, premise of it it was kind of dumb to be it's honest probably marketing occasionally like i know or i'm pretty sure detroit become human had multiple composers because there were multiple characters you played as and they were trying to like separate the composers based on character and i would guess that's a marketing ploy because it i don't sounds i don't yeah, maybe maybe that helps ju justify it. I think it was more the idea of that they just really wanted them to be sufficiently distinct. Yeah, and I also know. sometimes it's, depending on the production, especially in a game like that, it's also that there's almost like parallel productions that almost are not even in, True. in work. Like, for example, the guy that worked on the Connor thread of Detroit Become Human, Nima Fakara, he worked recently on the AC Mirage that just came out. And so they had one composer who was doing all the kind of narratives, you know, traditional music, but then they have this whole thing of wanting to produce a world of diegetic music where there's like street buskers and, and uh, like performers playing Arabic music throughout the streets. And they wanted somebody who lives and breathes that to produce all that. So there's sort of like two totally unrelated soundtrack albums from each other of the in-world music and the score. And they had two composers working, you know, in tandem on syndicate it was the same thing except it wasn't original music but there was a whole separate production doing all the street performers singing like english hymns and whatever on the street and like folk songs and all the piano bar stuff and i worked with them a tiny bit but generally yeah so that's a reason why sometimes but i don't know if you're if i feel like if you build it as a partnership it can work great because you learn each other's rhythms and things but mm -hmm. i always find it i've had a few where it took a little bit it's like dating, but you're like, except we're trapped on a lifeboat together. So we're like, we better sort it out because we're both signed a contract. And like, unless one of us wants to be the one that fucks us up uh, and, and you just don't know how it, how it can, can go. But I find it, I find it challenging. I am always in awe that, that the two of them have made it, you know, work so well and for so long. And because I find that I go down a rabbit hole of like psycho you know, banging on the wall and trying weird crap. And then like to then have to go, oh, right. Hey, cohort, you cool with all this? Like my brain, it's like slamming on the brakes for me. So that can be challenging. I don't know. I haven't figured, I just probably am antisocial, <laughs> but I don't know. No, but Rahul, that's true. That because how, that... how you felt working with the cat? 
What's that? It was your co-star, <laughs> the cat. Yeah. Do you feel similarly to how Austin just described? You know, you're just trying to bang on the walls. Yeah, I mean, I had I had a, a very particular way I wanted to do the scene. Yeah, and the, the cat, cat had their opinions. Yeah, the cat tough. The wrong cat opinions. Won. Yeah, oh, well, the <laughs> cat won. Cat did win. Yeah, um, cat also got COVID. The cat did get COVID. I love this story. Sorry, Andy. We'll come back to what you were going to say. That can you tell the story about the cat getting COVID? I think so. I feel like you can. Mike's spoken about so COVID stuff. The first day of the Leo loft stuff. Yeah. By the way, spoilers, everybody, if you haven't seen The Fall of the House, Sasha. Mm. I have watched it. Oh, have you? heard. Yeah. How many episodes? I saw all eight of them. Cool. I'm super proud. (laughs) And that's that's it. That's That's the the, review. Most of the review Austin has given. Austin's Austin's review is, I'm proud I watched it. I'm proud to have seen it. Awesome. Yep. Uh, It's your your (laughs) fault for for context. I wouldn't have thought to drive such a... Lot hard line on this if Rahul hadn't noticed that <laughs> that I actually hadn't offered an opinion. He was like, he's not told us if it's good, just that he's been watching it. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, and tell death so it shall be. Challenge accepted. <laughs> but anyway, cat got yeah, COVID. Just, this is a thing. Well, so what happened was obviously we shot this last year when there were still the COVID restrictions guidelines. And um it it I I don't know if I, I'm not sure Mike has done much press. No, I don't think he has yet, like because of the strikes. But I mean, I'm sure he'll say that this was a very difficult shoot for a multitude of reasons. Um, and you know, we had where on Midnight Mass we didn't have a single case of COVID. On Usher, we felt like we kept going down every few weeks. I like, got COVID like the day before you flew. Yeah. And so like you didn't get it thankfully yeah um but it was like uh, oh my god but it felt like, like, we have to separate you have to leave yeah it felt like it, it just it, it that that period of time it just was pot it was just happening almost every week or two we'd hear yeah. someone got it so it was always delayed um anyway so by the time we got to this self-contained almost episode which was uh leo's loft uh, i i was supposed to be shot out of the show because of other schedules so the character got kind of reduced to like only really being in one location. And um, it was going to take about a week and a bit to do all of Leo's loft scenes, which would cover basically his 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 arc. Is that a real loft or is it a set? Set. It's super cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where? An incredible oh, wow. job. This is in Vancouver. Mm. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, so we finally do our first scene. We get to the point now where we're going to do this and we're expecting a pretty easy week. It's mainly just me rather than large groups of actors. Um, and um, the first scene was shot. And then at lunchtime, uh, Trevor Macy took me and Flanagan out back to tell us that someone had caught COVID and that I was close to them. So they were whisked away. And so we had barely got through lunch before we had an issue so we kind of soldiered on, finished the day. The next morning I came in and I could see Flanagan was wearing his P95 mask, but he had tears. And I uh, I was like, now what? Um, and Is that empathy you're known for? <laughs> now what? <laughs> now what's the problem? <laughs> um, but it was like, oh God, what, what, like, it just felt like anything that could go wrong on this show was going wrong. And Flanagan had tears and then he kind of broke it to me and said that, this morning, COVID took away our cat because the cat was considered close contact. Um, and was, they were laughed to tears. Yeah, they were laughing, laughing to tears at just how ridiculous it was. So we only had two cats. Wait two a minute, identical... is that a thing? Can cats transmit COVID? This feels like they bullshit. They think dogs and cats can catch COVID. It, it felt like a bullshit thing that they were doing. It didn't feel. It's like a, of defa- like a level of like a level of anxiety that I, sort of goes into crazy town. I wasn't taken away because I, 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 they couldn't. What are they going to do? And they the were- person who had COVID was around both Rahul and the cat, but they took the cat away and not Rahul. Yeah, and that's when the crew all were like, "Oh, maybe these some of these guidelines are bullshit." It's so funny. Um, why is Rahul allowed on set with us when we know we know he was like? right next to that person anyway that explains so, why the whole cast by the end of the shoot were a bunch of hardcore red-pilled anti-vaxxers that were like <laughs> yeah it's all the fucking government man <laughs> exactly but um yeah so we had two cats and there was they were they were identical pretty much and they were trained by the same trainer there was one that 
could walk to marks uh, that you set. And then there was wow. the other one that was very good with people. So it would be still and and you could, you know, hold it. hold it. We lost the one that was good with people. So the cat that couldn't be touched, that hated people, but could walk to marks, uh, <laughs> did the heavy lifting for both cats. Mm-hmm. So there's a scene where Leo walks in holding the cat, the replacement, and gets scratched. That cat, we did that. That's the that, marks that, cat. There was about... 10 takes plus of just I couldn't get past to my mark before the cat would bolt That's so or funny. wriggle wow. its way out there's a few shots where uh, the cat I think must be CG right the marks are mm-hmm. way too specific and it I was I was kind of it was really well done but I was scrutinizing it going I think I'm, I'm fairly sure uh but it's getting harder and harder to tell as as the years I mean, have sure. gone I, don't think I remember though because when we saw the first cut there was still tons of CG it's a combination of all of it, really. There's a practical puppet that we used in different stuff right. um, that could move. The only one and... that struck me was where I just thought that would be so fucking hard to get with a real, even the most mm. well-trained cat in the world was the walking over the dead body on the sidewalk. So we did do that for real. Really? Yeah. We did. And that, is that you, Rahul, on the sidewalk? Or it you? was, yeah. yeah. And you uh, had to heat the ground that it was that the night. only day because it snowed. Yeah, it was the only day in Vancouver that it snowed. And it was me on the sidewalk in downtown oh. at 3 a.m. And they were blow torching the snow off the sidewalk. Uh, and I had to be shirtless. And didn't Mark Hamill come for that one? Yeah, Mark, they uh, they rang me in advance and went, Mark would like to hang out on set. Is that all right? And I was like, yeah. So he, he walked in with his cute little bubble hat uh at like 11 at night because it was freezing in vancouver and he just stayed with me in the green room for like two three hours just chatting what a about guy. Stuff. yeah he's amazing but well, anyway you, yes i assumed you used that opportunity to heavily defend the prequel trilogy i did yeah yeah uh but i didn't need to i think mark's a big fan of the prequels but Support we didn't talk up. we didn't talk about the newer stuff i stayed off that topic <laughs> <laughs> well from from the uh from the candid moments he had on uh, red carpets, mm. I, sus- yeah. I suspect he wouldn't hold back on opinions yeah. that I'm likely to agree with. <laughs> but uh, uh, I have a question about that. Um, the bit with smashing all the walls with the Thor hammer. Yeah. That stuff, does that entail... Uh, w- well... How do, how do I ask this? Basically, if 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 did you have to shoot that a bunch and they had to reconstruct shit, or is that just like nope? We're you better fucking get it because it's like it's a you set, can. but it's also not the biggest deal. I would think to throw up fresh drywall and re, like yeah. sets get re, rebuilt for things like that, but still, it you it was very destroyed, and yeah. I, I kept thinking like it, when you were talking about it, just wondering how 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 much for only a week you said for the whole yeah, thing. Yes, so Including so that. the. The smashing, all of all of that stuff was saved to the end, obviously, because I was going to trash that set. Um, so that was so we got everything we needed when it when it was in a you know when it was as was and it was good looking. And then when we got to those days, I think it was two days worth of of Carla and I uh, cat fighting. Started to throw around some of the props and smash and the drywalls. They were. Uh, staged in a way that they had multiple walls to just reinsert. Mm. But it wasn't unlimited. Like, there was still pressure. You didn't want to, like, screw it up. So, you you know, I didn't have an endless amount to go through. Um, maybe maybe three takes, two, three takes, and hope that we got it. And they were very specific about... The problem was I had to stay in a very kind of rage-filled, uncontrollable kind of thrashing around. But Michael Fimignari, who was the director of that episode, obviously uh, was very specific about we had certain places we had to hit for focus reasons, but also for continuity and things like that. So there was this like real hybrid of being absolutely kind of rage filled, but super accurate about mm-hmm. where this hammer's landing. Can wow. you put it right in this hole? That, that first one as well, where I think Leo takes the frame off the wall. I remember that one being, because we did it as a one-er, um, I had to be so specific. And and I think they put a tiny pencil mark where I had to hit it right in the middle. They also were going to, I remember pro, uh, the set designers and stuff were talking about 
pre-scoring the drywall, which would make it easier to to what does to that do mean? It. So they would go behind it, and they would score along the drywall to make it uh, to to make it easier to break away. You mean like cut? Yeah, I don't know what score means. Sorry. I was like, that's what Andy does. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, they pre-score it with a knife. Interesting. So that when I hit it, It'll it wouldn't take as much. But we, huh. uh, for some reason, we didn't do that. So each each single one was just straight drywall and and two days of it. Um, so do they replace it then? They were. They were having to replace. They were, you were just bringing in sheets of wall? Um, yeah, we would just do a scene and then we would take a break and then come back and they'd have cleaned up all the mm -hmm. all the mess. And um, we, there were certain things we couldn't keep doing. Like, I think I throw Leo's cabinet on uh, to the ground. I think we left that till last and that was a one-er because I think I smashed some of the picture frames in there and some of the props. But yeah. That was what about was, the 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 end over the rail is that is there something over the side like well how how's that how's that all going down there's a funny story with that so i've had an issue in uh, this is a canada issue um bar once i've had one stunt double his name's sam i met him on i zombie and he's a sam fantastic. neil sam uh worthington from <laughs> avatar fame um but but um so i like sam, sam neil better but <laughs> so Sam, Sam, whose name I'm last name I'm blanking on right now, but Sam was my stunt double in in I Zombie, and they managed to find a dude that was a fantastic double for me. You couldn't tell. And then Sam, I think, worked on the Revenant and blew his knee out, and we lost Sam for a while. And then I started to deal with, and not just on I Zombie, but just in general with Canada, uh, stunt performers in brownface. Uh, and I was like, this is a problem why we, we can't what are, how are we not able to find a proper stunt double for me because there just hasn't been really much of a need and i don't think many south asians go into stunts um plus you're so, inordinately tall yeah. and i'm a big uh, yeah i am a pain in the ass to double for we've yeah. also had actors who are we've had uh black stunt performers in bra in brown face like it being it, it's just always been problematic i'll always come into the makeup room and see some stunt performer getting some form of, of of skin transition and i'm like jesus anyway so um our stunt coordinator on usher found um a, a south asian stunt guy a stunt, stunt coordinator krista she found a south asian guy to train up and was like right we're gonna we're gonna get you in it's your first gig and you're gonna be royal coley stunt double and he had been waiting for two days because i did a lot of the stuff i don't that a lot of the breakaway stuff, a lot of the fighting, it they weren't sure what I was wanting to do, what I didn't want to do. So he was always on standby. And then I tried to talk myself into jumping off the balcony, which was like a 15 foot drop onto pads because oh. it was an elevated stage. Um, and Mike and Krista and everyone was like, don't be an idiot. And this guy had been waiting for two days. And I'd also complained that there hasn't been a South Asian stunt. Uh, and they get you one. And like, they get me this. one. And I'm like, I got it, bro. Yeah. I'm the next Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he did it. And he did a fantastic job. I think it's funny because I'm quite doughy as Leo. But if you watch it in slow motion, I, as I run up off the balcony and take a swing, I fall off with a six pack. <laughs> uh and I remember on set when whenever the guy fell, uh, Flanagan would play the Wilhelm scream, <laughs> and we were like, "Oh my god, we should keep that in." That's amazing. Yeah. So I need to check my audio. The levels just jumped in a way that is slightly concerning. See how that just went up by itself. I don't like that. I uh, another question I have. So it's not really an interview show, but it's sort of become that. Uh, but I want to know what you had to do before shooting to be worthy of lifting Mjolnir. <laughs> uh, but I that, play, that's out I, of your hands, I feel like. It was, I think I got residual worthiness from playing Sheriff Hassan in Midnight Mass. I was, was going to make a separate joke about how I really liked how your costume was inspired by Joel from The Last of Us on House of Usher. <laughs> Nice. That whole that whole Viagra scene, you know, in Jackson and Last of Us Part Two. Classic. Yeah. Classic really. Show. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Good. It's good stuff. Cool. Uh, people keep asking about the game too. What games you were playing? Dumb question. Are you actually playing the video game during the shots? No, none of question. them. Right. 
Pre recorded. Yeah, because I, I was. I was Is it on screen? It's not. It's not like a green. <laughs> it wasn't keyed in. No, it was being played through playback on the screen, so I oh. could match. And it was only short because it's all it's all been cleared through legal. They they choose like Mortal Kombat submitted their portion, Cyberpunk submitted their portion, and then it was just played on the screen for real. Um, and then although it's usually keyed in. Wait, right? Flanagan brought his own PlayStation in. Did I play you Last of, of Us? You were kind of like interacting with it within the scene too, as if like, I don't know. I don't know if that, it was just, it, it played so like fluidly. It seemed uh, like, yeah. Yeah, I think I got to match the PC I did as well. I think I got to match what was on there. So I watched it a few times, memorized what the player was doing. And then, cause I get annoyed with video game playing if it's weird. But, um, but I do think, I could be wrong. I remember Flanagan had his actual PlayStation plugged in. Leo's playing Flanagan's one from his trailer. And I think I might have played Last of Us. Last of Us might have been one of the only ones. I can't I can't remember, but I, I remember us having to muck around with the controller mm. um, and charging it. Um, but I was going to ask Andy a question. Um, on the soundtrack, why was my song the, for when the Black Cat, why was that the only one excluded from that album? <laughs> wow, Andy, disrespect. <laughs> wow. So so there's certain cute we're we're given like the album is like asked to be a certain length to fit like a maximum number of tracks and sometimes if it's going to be vinyl it's like kind of limited although they've been expanding the vinyl range yeah. I think like it used to be I feel like it used to be 22 minutes and now I feel like it's like 29 minutes is that do you know Austin is it like 29 on a single side on a single side maybe i'm wrong it's pretty like, long yeah i feel like that, that's probably wrong but i feel like it's been expanded anyway long story short rahul that track got cut because it was like basically it came down to like violent tracks got cut and that was like a su mm. super yeah. violent track obviously yeah. um, it shouldn't have been cut though i now i feel really bad now that's I feel fine. Vi no, that's violent as in like the music sounds violent yeah, or in that it was playing in the background of a violent scene that the music is violent yeah interesting like, yeah it's less of a musical experience although in some cases it's it 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 plays really well because we got to hear it on the stage and by itself that music sounds so fun and like because it's changing so much and doing there's so much going on with it You're who's, your own who's, uh, version of it. who's weighing in on that who's i've like i'm not used to people energy like i've i definitely like netflix in particular has a bit of a thing about the maximum length of their albums we ran into this on the ty cave show where it was like four and a half hours of music and they were like we'd like a 45 to 60 minute album and i was like it's gonna be 90 and yeah. just embrace it and even then Isn't we are cutting the shit really long for an album for a soundtrack of a whole yeah. season of television that's True. that's like that's like you you're cutting hours, it's nothing yeah, it's exactly. I mean, and it's it's not like the old days where CDs were the governing thing, where the maximum you could get on a CD was like seventy two minutes on the dot. That was like the absolute high end, and so that's how long. I, but even then, most people were like, "Yeah, they don't need to be that." Most cues are not like don't need to be there. But still, over this much runtime, you know, or you could do the Mandalorian thing where they just go, "How about one soundtrack for every episode?" Or like mm -hmm. Rings of Power, where they did the same. Yeah. Uh, but so anyway, you were told maximum runtime, but also they were giving you like well, creative editorial. No, not at all. No, no, no. They didn't. Get, so basically the, it started actually on Midnight Mass. On Midnight Mass, we had so much music because there were the hymns. There were these like long sort of pieces that indulgence on the part of the organ player. <laughs> that guy don't get me started on that guy and he uh, plays fucking... the organ in midnight mass he uh, literally portrays the organ he yeah. is he is playing he is he is the organ being played by an actor as the organ yeah yeah, yeah. the organ um they uh so on midnight mass we had we put we were like fuck it let's put it oh i shouldn't i don't know if i could swear no no, no you're fine go ahead okay okay fuck it the let's fact that you're not in a suit and tie also this is a pretty pretty buttoned up podcast sorry yeah but i yeah. do appreciate that you were standing for the whole of it <laughs> yeah very nice um on midnight mass we really wanted to put everything out because everything was so deliberate that we did for midnight mass um and we really wanted to reflect the whole show when we did that though we weren't thinking about vinyl we were just thinking about we want the hymns we want all the like 
the, the piece on the beach and all the crazy pieces and the nice pieces. We wanted everything to come together. Well, then when it came time for the vinyl, they were like, cool, we can only, this is how many, this is what we're limited to unless we do like eight vinyl. It wasn't going to be eight. I think it was going to be, it was going to have to be four, four vinyls. And it was just ridiculous as far as like production costs and everything. So the idea was we had to like wrangle it down. So this time uh, we were trying to learn from our, our mishaps and we were uh, trying to like put the soundtrack together in a way where we could do, we could mirror the release, the digital release with the vinyl release, but it still sucks. And now I feel really bad that that. No, I'm joking. I'm, I, I, <laughs> no. I, um, no, because it should be. Also, I'm, I, I've been listening to, is it at last? Oh yeah, at last. Yeah, at last is like I, I listen to that almost every day, or when I'm when I'm out about on uh, town. I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've loved every everything. I've been with you now since what Bly Manor. Yeah. Um, and you guys have always done right by me. Like every monologue, you've you've helped me. Dignity. Dignity was a good one, but like every monologue, you guys have taken from like a six to a ten for me just by helping. You know, I'm trying to force out a single tear, and then, but you guys are right there, like underscoring. Andy, when it comes to something like a monologue, are you, do you start the process of composing when you're reading the script, or do you wait to see the scenes? Or, like, at what time are you composing for a scene like that? That's a good question, mate. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's a little of each with, especially with Flanagan, it's a little of each. Like, usually it's like he'll send the script early on, we'll write things to the script. Um, but then as things get shot, everything changes. And sometimes mm -hmm. things from the script work, sentiments from the script work, themes from the script work. But oftentimes then when the, the footage comes in, everything starts to sort of change and, and everyone starts to, you know, kind of adjust. And I mean, huge props. And this is where it like Flanagan and Macy, like when they're when they're sort of when we're doing like playbacks for, you know, like Midnight Mass is a, is a great example when we're doing playbacks, they have a very good sense of like what first what what they want to achieve in the spotting. We want to achieve this. Let's go for this. And then we'll execute a version of that. And then they'll have very specific ideas of how we can craft it by just doing little things. Um, there's actually in episode seven, there's a scene where Mike had an idea to score Carla's dialogue exactly to her words but just for mm. one moment at the end of her dialogue and i'll send you the i'll send you the the cue but it comes together like really nicely and and you know it was a brilliant idea from mike he was like hey you know in the score right at this section when carla's doing this thing could you have the violins actually play the melody you have in here but have the melody play around her, like with exact words. That's of her so dialogue. cool. Just for like five or six syllables. It was like really subtle, but his ability and, and Trevor's ability to sort of see these things and like bring them together. I mean, I give big, big props to the two of them for, you know, being able to sort of articulate. Um, Cause it's a tricky thing, you know, like talking, yeah. like Austin, you know, like some people talk music better than others. It, I almost find it easier when people talk no musical lingo and they talk feelings like I want to feel mm. sadder, or more heroic or like this way, as opposed to like, maybe we should go minor here and then and that's OK, too. But I prefer it when almost never means what they think it means or they they don't realize it's it's it. it I always say to them, you know, imagine if I just look at a script or the better way to phrase it is when an executive looks at your script and just takes one random line in isolation goes, can't it just be this? And like the writer is feeling the domino effect in all directions that that causes. That is very similar to when Bill just go, can't you just be minor here? It's like, well, sometimes if we're lucky, a change like that might be exactly the right thing. But then I'm also trying to like put together a, a larger whole. So let's think about what's the goal that we're chasing here. Is it is it that the scene is not heavy enough? Is it that the scene yeah. is is coming across, you know, laterally like it's 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 supposed to be darkly funny, but there's no sense of irony to it? Is it that it's just simply too fast? Is it that it's moving too much? Is there is there just the music is overstating its case or we're, we're in the way of the actors or or blah, 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 blah. You just like start unpacking what's the fundamental goal of the scene. Uh, and because, yeah, in my experience, 
almost never does it help <laughs> to yeah. Yeah. to uh, sp speak in direct musical terms. Uh, yeah. And Mike's uh, Mike is a like. Mike he's a musician like, right mike mike's yeah, quite a good he's, so yeah. good he's like the visual would be like uh uh you know when skywalker shows up at the end on top of the mountain uh from uh oh which force show? awakens force awakens at the very end you know that scene i think of mike is like there'll be there'll be moments where we're like trying to crack a cue and it's like 80 percent there but we're trying to land one thing and mike will be in the studio and he'll just say like wait what key are we in like oh we're in whatever c minor He'll walk over and just like, what if we go, you're here, you're doing this. What if we go to this? Boom. And he'll just like, he's done it multiple times. Like, wow. what if we go to that? And it, and it works. It's very, that's very atypical. <laughs> I, know, I, I was talking to uh, Brett, who's uh, the editor on uh, Usher, for maybe like an hour on the weekend, just being like, how does this work? And he had so much positive stuff to say about Mike and uh, Femi, who, uh, what's his full name? Michael Feminari. Michael Feminari, who, who yeah. uh, directed with Mike. In a that way that's just DP. like, yeah, um, like because he's got a, a back a background in editing, he almost shoots like an editor in some ways, so he can give all this advice to an editor that a lot of people can't. I feel like Mike must be a very he, he can also writer. act is the other yeah. annoying, and do accents, yeah, um, and can play music and can edit and. Yeah. It's it's yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bit he's, much. He's a bit really. He even I mean, looks am, he even looks much. amazing as a stunt double in brownface. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he also he also, which most people a lot of people don't know, he sings in Midnight Mass, right? He's on the. He sure does. Yeah. And he, single takes. He came over to the studio one morning. Single like didn't even really need the sheet music of the hymns. Just stepped right up to the mic, and we were like, "Yeah, just go right up there." We hit space bar, and just single takes of like eight verses of you know catholic hymns as we did them and he just sing right through it and he finished the first take of one he took the you know the headphone off he's like we good and we're like we are let's do the next one like just <laughs> like that crazy i yeah. mean i feel like everyone involved in this show is so talented like it's such a good cast across the board like everyone's just so fun to watch it's so bombastic just next time i i uh i just realize it was driving me nuts i was like why the hell do i know this name of michael Fimignari? um he dp'd on one of my favorite films i've ever scored i just realized really a long a long time ago yeah next time you talk to him ask him about yeah. a, a movie called leave um leave. yeah director this saint of a human being director from new york named bob celestino um and uh the film is like Truly just this amazing, the two of the actors from Band of Brothers, all those guys are all still super close. Like they're lit, just a band of brothers still. And um, they all were young. That was kind of their launching pad for most of them in their career mm -hmm. to all be working actors. And and so, but as they, you know, started pushing 40, they all, a lot of them started turning to more writing, producing, uh, that kind of stuff. And, and so two of the guys, Frank John Hughes and Rick Gomez uh, wrote, produced and star in this film that Bob uh, directed and Michael shot um, and um, fucking great. I was one of those, I was like, God, I've heard this name a thousand times. Um, and it was driving me crazy trying to remember why, sorry to interject, but I was like yeah, sitting here it. going, yeah, it was, you know, it's typical fate of a lot of indie sort of mm -hmm. thrill. It's mm -hmm. a great little film. It's got Brian Cranston in it also. And, and the two of them, you know, they both named their characters after their real life sons and like really got into like they spent months workshopping the the script together and mm -hmm. and Frank and Rick and um, so good. So actually, I use the story of that film all the time. Sorry to derail all this discussion, but there was a um, it's, it's who you are, Austin. It's fine. It, I know it's true. Um, the um, uh I, I, a lot younger, I'm sure you have this also, Andy, that younger composers will often, you know, just, or like you speak to a Berkeley class or UCLA class or something. And there's often like the last thing before you leave is, you know, do you have any general advice? And the thing I often have landed on is um, it's better to be sort of to embrace choices that may be divisive, knowing you might not get the job um, than to kind of be this milk toast. I'll do whatever you want. Uh, you know, very kind of unopinionated person with no perspective. And I always use that film uh, called Leave as my example, where I, I, so the, how I got that was another one of the Band of Brothers guys is, is an actor named Ross McCall. And I had scored a movie that he was in 
and we ended up hanging out after the film was over and got along really well and 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 he pitched me to these buddies were having a hard time finding a composer that was working out on their film leave so he goes I, I know this guy you should you should meet him and he I had given like I had had a few albums come out on CD at that point and he gave them to them and I get this breathless phone call from Ross he's got this thick Scottish accent and he's like hey bud I gave your CDs I hope that's okay but these guys are my favorite people ever in this industry Sorry, they're the best this again with the Scottish accent I wouldn't dream of it <laughs> um <laughs> Ross is a really really good dude though and um and yeah, he pitched me hard to these guys. And so I just get a call, cold call from these two actor friends. And they're like, we're gonna work, you know, uh, come, we'd love to meet you. We're at, we're at Little Doms in Los Feliz. Uh, and so I go drive down there and they're like, we'd love for you to, you know, pitch on this film. And I, I had it in my mind. I was like, I'm gonna see if I can talk them out of making me demo and if I can just get the job just by sheer force of will which, you know, I had, I had a chip on my shoulder about writing demos back in those days. Um, and so, uh, so they were like, look, we're both actors and we will spend two weeks. You re you get a few pages. You have to imagine the arc of this character. Cause you don't even necessarily have the full script. You spend two weeks crafting it, nailing it. You go in, you audition. They tell you that was fucking awesome. You're just like four inches too short for the the role or you're four inches too tall or this or that or we're casting this person opposite you and we we think that the chemistry is going to work or like a thousand reasons why you're perfect and somehow not like you can be great but not right yeah and as an expression i heard at some point that i that stuck with me as well and so they're like you on the other hand can just go get this job like <laughs> none of that shit's going to interfere with you you can just go write a kick-ass demo and so that was their way of saying like get over yourself and so i go okay well, i have one request can i watch the because they wanted me to take a crack at the opening scene and i said can i watch the whole movie first at least and they were like okay fine so they go here's a dvd it's only about 90 minutes we're gonna just sit here and keep having coffee so i raced home i watched it i came back they're still at the same no table way, that's so funny and i was blown away i'm like in tears i thought this movie was unbelievable and so Even I was like, okay, any music, I feel like music, it, well, it had, such... it had temp, you know, oh, just okay, like okay. random crap thrown in there and, and it worked fine. You know, it was very ambient and, but just, a, it's one of these movies that does not go where you think it's going to go. And I was so blown away and their performances were amazing. Like you could tell that this was built. They, they knew every word backward and forward. They had produced it, written it. Like you could feel that this was such a labor of love. And thank God I watched the whole thing because it gave me this idea of like, I can kind of bury the lead in the opening scene. I can hint at what this is going to be in a way that if you then go back and watch it, you're like, oh shit, they were, they were telegraphing in a super subtle way what this was right out of the gate. And so I put together, got in, brought in singers and crazy musicians and we were doing weird shit where we're like taking, you know, cello bows on styrofoam cups and, you know, all this stuff. And I sent it off and I'm like, fucking in the bag director calls me and who I hadn't met he lives in New York and he calls me and he goes everything about what you did was wrong for this scene this was absolutely <laughs> not right but it was so crazy that you should be the guy to score this film so he's like yeah. we're gonna start blank page but I want someone who's willing to take those kinds of wild swings um, and it was like such a light bulb this was 14 years ago, something like that. It was like a crazy light bulb career moment of I'd so much rather get a job this way. I'd also rather not get a job if someone who takes wild swings is a huge turnoff for the director and they're going, uh, you know, this, this, I kind of want someone who's going to more or less just, you know, one, four, five their way through the scene. And that's that. Uh, I was like, I, I just click with people like this guy. Um, and so anyway, that was, DP'd by my, Michael Fimignari. <laughs> there's my simple. reason. Yeah, there's my... And I'll tell you, uh, I'll just to give a bit of context on how long I've known Andy. Um, I might have the timeline of this wrong because I've mythologized this a little bit in my head over the last decade plus. But two things happened in quick succession with each other. I was sharing a studio with a composer named John Debney at the time. He owns this building by the Warner Brothers lot and his outfit is upstairs and he had some rooms and I was in one of them um, down on the lower floor. And John has, you know, done a million big films, 
uh, Oscar nominee for The Passion of the Christ, done a lot of Favreau movies like Elf and Zathura and Iron Man 2 and Jungle Book and uh, Tom Shadyac movies, Liar Liar, Bruce Almighty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of comedies in particular. He also works on The Orville uh, mm. now for Seth MacFarlane. Old school, orchestral, but he's done a lot. He's done a ton of stuff, like shit tons of stuff. And um, and so uh, one day this guy just knocks on the door. Uh, uh, like literally, I think it was just like you, I think if memory serves, John goes, hey, you should go introduce yourself to the guy downstairs, right? Because you yeah. two are old friends. Yeah. And so I just like some random dude knocks on the door and I yeah. had no idea who you were. And and I want to hear your like your side of that in case I'm missing up. But the funny thing was, so in t- parallel around that same time, this was like 12, 13 years ago for I do not remember where the connection came from, but I randomly got asked to pitch on a film. And exactly like the story I just told, I pitched the weirdest fucking approach. But unlike that other, I couldn't watch the whole film. They just sent me two scenes and I had no idea what was what. And so I wrote some weird shit. I recorded myself drumming with paper, with colored pencils on a tambourine and like all this weird stuff. It was like a bunch of weird. It was not, I recorded the sound of tearing paper and made a like percussion out of it and all this stuff. Did not get the job. This guy got the job and I had no idea who, oh, who he was. Uh, I, well, the Newton brothers got the job and I was like, what the fuck is that? And then it was like, it was in my mind the next day you knock on the door and then it was like, oh, you're that you're the Newton brother. Brother. Uh, <laughs> what a weird. Wow. Yeah. That was the movie Detachment. Wait, oh, and yeah. then did you like go without speaking until recently? <laughs> no, I, I fully thought I introduced all. the two of you for some reason. I did not no, realize not, we knew each other before. Not at all. Not at all. We had met that day, and I remember that day because I remember coming into your room, and you had you had all the scores on CD. You had you had you had a whole wall full of scores, which is like for composers, that's like a wet fucking dream. Like it's all you <laughs> all you want to do is like listen to scores, talk about scores, like list like talk to other people <laughs> about them. Where were they? Read the liner notes, and I walked into your room, and you had. Right? Didn't you have? I recalled like a shelf full of like CDs of scores, and also uh, conductor scores. Yeah, uh, big. Yes. And it's and and things have not changed. There's, uh, you can't really see the um, the CDs are behind the black yeah. thing here, but there and yeah, there's also sheet music just all over the floor. Um, yeah, of course. Well, we we didn't know any. We don't know each other really, but because of that, we just started talking about scores. I, and I don't even remember the specifics but i remember you started with like oh you, you familiar with this score and that and we just started rapping and it was just a real uh easy conversation very nerdy we should have done detachment together <laughs> again the yeah, Newton triplets, bring them back the hilarious thing that uh, the full circle on that one is that a couple of years ago i got asked to produce a score for adrian brody because he wanted to try to score a movie um, and it was, it was a director that I do all of his movies. And so the director was like, how about you work with my guy? And he was always, he was very like, he carries this, um, like how to describe it. It, it bums him out that more people didn't see that film because he's like, he was like, I, I, I gave everything I had to that role. And I really feel like it, that film actually really kind of like it added up into something, you know, because he goes, sometimes you show up on set and then you watch the film at the premiere and you're like, boy, that's different than what I thought it was going to be. And you feel a little like, like shrinking down in your seat. And he was, you know, you could feel that there were some movies he had done that he was less excited about. But that one, he was like, it's a shame that no one saw that movie. Uh, and uh, and yeah, he, he was real excited. He was, you know, wanted to. And I was like, you know, what's funny is I pitched on that. He was like, what the fuck? Andy, what was your demo? If if Austin was out there using pencils yeah. and tambourines and shredding paper, what, what did you do? So I, re- I remember getting those scenes too, Austin. It's funny. Like I remember getting the scenes and not having the context, which is really difficult because you don't have a lot to like, you you know, like, yeah. the You in- don't even really know what genre movie it is. It, like it's, it's one of those yeah. where you just, it's like a scene of a teacher in a classroom. So yeah, and you're going- very similar to what Rahul has to deal with the audition yeah. scripts. For sure. I mean, oh, yeah. I- yeah, I mean that must Art. be like Rahul. When you get an audition for a script, like you could go in 
a thousand different directions, right? Even if you're given a general oh, direction, like Andy, sorry to derail, but I'll I can talk about it now. I didn't know that I auditioned for Tenant, right? <laughs> Christopher <laughs> Nolan. So here's what they for told the Kenneth me. Branagh role, though. I still don't know. <laughs> All I got for Tenant was Christopher Nolan audition. Oh, and then s- dummy sides, no character name, no. Context. Oh, like fake, fake line, like like to avoid leaks a, and stuff. A fake monologue that was nothing to do with the show. Oh, I wasn't wow. told age, race, uh, accent, accent, location, nothing. Chris Nolan, this date, put yourself on tape. And I was like, how do I maximize so my nuts. opportunity here? What's he looking for? How do I do anything? And it's so you're just pissing in the dark, right? And then uh, obviously I didn't hear back, but like, yeah, it can be frustrating sometimes. Like, yeah, you don't even know what that character actually is in the movie. Like, you literally have zero idea. But I, I never know. I'll never find out because I, I, um, I'm quite mature, and I don't hold grudges. So any show that I audition for that I don't get cast in, I never watch. So I never, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I haven't seen Tenant. It's the only Nolan film I ain't watched. I ain't seen Ring of Power. Um, I have to be careful. It, here, it, so I can, I can, I can mess share, up NDAs but, here, yeah. but yeah, I don't watch them. If uh... also, I just want to say, audio listeners, if my if my microphone is jumping around, apologies. I guess video listeners as well. I can see that our levels keep going up and down. It, and might, it might be annoying. I I don't know this. I want to throw something to you. How did you and Mike and Taylor start working together? What was the was it was it Hill House? No, it was before then, right? Yeah, it was Oculus. Oculus. I was going to say I know this story too because Molly Elfman and I got coffee around that time, and she was talking all about this guy Mike Flanagan. Oh, uh, who who and, directed me, Molly Elfman in Next Exit? Yeah, and, yeah. Which is great, by the way. That was oh, no, it was all right. Yeah, yeah, yes. yes. Yeah, uh, we met Mike on Oculus and we came in just as like an interview and it was like strangely and 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 greatly. That's the wrong adverb for that. But like it was in person, which is so rare these days. Usually it's just do a demo, send in a demo or whatever. This was like they interviewed some people uh, in person. Um, who hooked that up? Like how did what who made that connection? I think that that came through. I want to say that that came through cutting edge really had they yeah, were they, they repping you or something like like the edge? they were connected to um becca nelson who was our agent at the time and is cutting, cutting edge, edge like a music agency like cutting edge is connected to aradell that was the yeah connection. i think they um, owned aradell yes, they owned Ar- yeah yeah and so we were with aradell at the time an agency and so we just, it's just that, yeah, it was just like air, air. air. Yeah. So this is one of those weird, I didn't know you ever rep. They're mostly British composers, but cause air, air is this British company. They also like the f- most, one of the most famous recording studios in the world air, air studios. Um, I'm pretty sure was part of that same kind of conglomerate. Um, but they were owned by cutting edge, which was, is still um, this weird. I don't even know how to describe it. Cause there's, they're like a unique um, they're essentially like a music library meets production company that will comp- like studios will make a deal with them and say, hey, if you pitch in some of the money for the cost of our composer and our score, you'll re- you get to have the rights to it to then sub license out for other things. So they're like running kind of like a side hustle uh, to to, you know, maximize the tail end profits on the music in exchange for taking the burden of production and all that off of a given product. That's their pitch, at least. My agents, I feel like a lot of agents really don't like them um, uh, and they can be very challenging to deal with. Uh, I've had limited experience with them and they were medium, I would say. Yeah, uh, but yeah. Back, what was the? Qu- uh, qu- oh yeah, it was uh, about Mike, Andy Mike, and yeah, Taylor yeah, meeting. Oculus. Yeah, and it was just a yeah. And honestly, it, you know how those meetings go. You walk in the room, you talk about music, you, and it's like you're not sure if you'll get it or not. Uh, and we got it, and it was you know we we jumped right into it with with uh, Mike and Trevor. I mean, everyone was sort of like no know, demo, uh, just off the meeting. Does an, no does an demo, interview? Yeah. Is it just like if you're interviewing for a composing position? Is it like? just making sure you understand a vibe? Like what kind of questions do you get in an interview like that? Usually all kind like, I mean, 
I find that the best interviews I feel like are the ones in person where you can decide if you sort of get along. Cause like yeah. I, every project is like a bit of a marriage. It's, it's, you need to, it's the first date and you, you'd like to have another date, assuming you both, you know, get along and, you know, have similar interests and whatever. Making sure you, you would enjoy working together, I guess, yeah. is step one. Yeah. Yeah. And it's weird because early on in our career, I feel like I just wanted to have a second date. Like, let's go on the first, I just wanted all like, we want, you want to, you want to work with people. You want to, yeah. um, and now it's, and now it's become a little, I've tried to be a little more patient with like, Oh, I really like this film, but like, we just don't get along like this, mm. you know, there's certain, not, not, not get along, but there's just not, you know, it's, it's difficult because you're, you know, in any creative endeavor, I mean, I'm sure like, Rahul, you've probably been on set where on a variety of projects where maybe you disagree with how you're being asked to do a certain thing. Sure. Yeah. And and sometimes there's compromise, but I bet sometimes they're like, no, 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 we just want you to like you do it as we told you to do it. Yeah, yeah. we want you to just do it. Mm -hmm. And and that's and that's the tricky line. And I think that that's I feel really lucky to have been, you know, Taylor and I both to brought in to like be with the sort of Flaniverse because Mike is so sort of suggestive with ideas and then interested in like, Hey, I gave you this idea and you gave me this, that's yeah, what well, the collaboration play, between me. and that like really gets me off. Like that's where yeah. I really, because I feel like that's where you see things really start to become interesting when ideas mm -hmm. start to expand past a place where you can see them. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, you, yeah. You would never think like midnight mass. I never would have thought that we we're going to have like, you know, 45 seconds of silence in the middle of a piece of score cue, but like Flanagan wanted something really like it needed to really tell you something about how to feel in the scene. And so that was, you know, one of a few ideas of, of ways to execute. What it. scene, what scene was that? That was on the, it started on the beach actually. The whole beat oh, in the beginning yeah, of yeah, episode yeah. two with the amazing camera work. That, Super long yeah. one. -er. Yeah, oh, the big one. Fucking that was awesome. One of your first days, wasn't oh, it? That was my first day. day. Yeah. Is that a crane, Rahul? How did that whole thing, how did that one? -er... Good question. How did they do that? It was handheld, didn't it? It was handheld? That's right. Oh, God, I don't remember around. anything. But doesn't it end and it like pulls out? <laughs> nah, I think it's handheld. They just do a Yui. I think it was handheld. I think it's James. I think it's, it might be Jimmy. Wow. Uh, I can't remember um yeah but but then so you've been with on everything flanagan related since oculus since oculus yeah oh yeah. wild yeah okay yeah. that's damn that's yep. awesome very it's obvious that though. that's a guy that people love working with considering every single actor also appears in every single product like that's such a testament i feel like that alone yeah. just just looking at the recurring yeah roster because at some point if someone's an asshole people are just going to turn it down you know like yeah like very few especially at that level it's not like it's not like everybody is so starved for opportunity that they're they'll overcome their hatred just to to do it like you know it it's it's really obvious that 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 is just a both ways i think is that like everyone who's being asked to return has got to be people that mike considers to be very easy to work with and enjoys working with as well for sure probably everyone together like if you hated one of the other actors you probably wouldn't want to do it you know it's like it's a testament to all of those people, like a hundred percent good people included there for sure. I think yeah. that's, that's exactly when you were asking what gets asked in those meetings, it's that kind of thing. It's the, it's not like they don't ask job interview questions. You just shoot the shit yeah. and talk about life and, and make sure that you're on the same wavelength because you want to know that when the pressure is on and like things are due yesterday and you're behind budget under budget all that stuff like that that um that it's somebody that you genuinely like being in that situation with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because then you'll then you'll do whatever it takes you know yeah. uh right. it's it, it's that's it's yeah someone telling you do it again I, it's not working let's start from scratch that needs to be someone that you're like they're not I know they're not saying that because they're an asshole. They're saying it because we haven't found it yet. And I will yeah. do anything for someone I care about, even if it means totally burning to the ground, something I just yeah. spent a week working on, you know? Yeah. I, I want to say something for both of you, actually, because I think it's such a wonderful relationship that 
um, I, 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 when I was at drama school, it never really clicked for me. Um, I struggled with learning in that environment, Stanislavski and technique and things like that. And nothing clicked for me until I kind of went off the rails a bit. I remember I was watching Gangs of New York making of, mm. and I, I was probably one of the middling students in the group, uh, sort of there, not going to really do anything. And then I, I heard behind the scenes, which is so funny now, full circle. Henry Thomas is in Gangs of New York. But anyway, so I'm watching the, the DVD <laughs> and they say that Bill the Butcher, Daniel Day-Lewis, was playing Eminem in his trailer. Mm. And I was like, oh, now why wow. is that happening, right? Why is he listening to old school Eminem That's for Bill the Butcher? And I was like, because that music resonates with him and it allows him to keep in character and he's assigning a playlist, right? So I thought, well... What I'm being taught isn't working. Let me, I'm such a big fan of score and music. Let me try that. And all of a sudden my work and my character work just like went, it, I just leaped up the class a little bit and I started yeah. to learn. So I create playlists. I'm, I'm, I'm when I have my headphones in at work, um, that's what I'm doing. I, I usually, I, I'll read the script and start getting an idea and I start putting a little mini plays together depending on who the character is. And then I'll have songs that are either for the character or for the emotion. So for instance- I should really do that for writing. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I know yeah. a lot of writers do where it's like, if I had like a mood playlist- <coughs> It keeps would, you there. Yeah, it's a really good and, idea. And it's such a quick shortcut, you mm. know? So for a good a good example of it is Midnight Mass, you know, when the church has gone, gone to shit and we're, we're doing that. Obviously, I did a lot of the, the heavy lifting on the fighting. I was, I think I was fighting three, four, five stunt guys all over the place. The whole time I was listening to Mick Gordon, Doom Eternal, <laughs> uh, the only, the, uh, the only uh, one they fear, they fear is, is you. you. And it's fun. like, down, down, right? So I'm listening to that constantly. And then when it comes to seeing the show, you guys have scored on top of that. So it's like this lovely, which then <laughs> I'll use like Usher, so you know what I'm saying? It's or like, like I just, to yeah, and we just keep yeah. coming back full circle. So yeah. I use other scores. Okay, great example. Midnight Mass, whole shoot, Ennio Morricone, all of it. The whole playlist, Sheriff Hassan on my phone is 90% Ennio Morricone, Nick Cage. Cinema the, Paradiso. Uh, we That's got, a joke. It's the most, <laughs> I know it's, I know it's a hundred percent not what you were listening to. Although that <laughs> no, would be it interesting. Was, <laughs> It was, it was it was all dollars trilogy and, and yeah stuff of course like that of course the sheriff and then it was Nick Cave um, the the assassination of Jesse James soundtrack um, and then like yeah and then so I, that that's the soundtrack of the actor on the day and then obviously you don't know what's going to come when you guys mm. see our footage and then you know bring that to yeah, it. I don't know I just I, I love say the... that mention of Austin CD wall you'd do the same thing you love a, a good score love a good score big score Austin nerd. took me to the opera. That's true. You know, actually, just before the call, uh, actually this... all weekend, Figaro, we... Figaro. I've been... <laughs> been listening to the songs we heard at the opera because uh, Austin took us. I, I saw yeah. I saw your thing on Instagram and I sent it to Andrea and I was like, "Job well Success. done." I love yeah. it. We had such a good time. If I can, when I feel something like even that piece of music, I, it goes in the phone and I don't know when. Oh, look at that. Oh yes. Nice. Yeah. Do a little do a little sing along. Are you ready to uh the Barbara of Seville? But like I I'll so use funny. that. I don't know when, but that piece of music gets me a little bit excited and a little bit jolly and and happy. Happy. I've silly. always my mum said that was the first thing I reacted to as a baby was music. Like I think most kids do. But like it would she could just play music and I'd be happy and I and I would bop. So I've always had such a strong relationship to it. So like Barbara Seville, if I'm stuck, if I'm finding it difficult on set to do something, I'm going to crank that Got up because I know, I know it's, I know how it makes me feel. So I, I keep these little checklists. Here's so you a, guys, um... you guys inspire us, inspire us twice for me anyway. <laughs> so. Here's a question related to that. Then uh, if you, let's say you spent, I'll just make up that you had a month, uh, before you're like well you're kind of in prep before you're really shooting on midnight mass and let's say you're just round the clock listening to dollars trilogy stuff and other yeah. kind of leone vibe music and then at some point mike's like oh i like re interesting i what i was kind of picturing him much more of a you know 
Tim Allen uh, or whatever, you know, like this sure. is home improvement vibe, you know, sure. like, yeah, yeah. where you're and is that one of those where you go, this is a way I internalize it and it's not, it's not going to impact how we shape the character or would you have to like build a new playlist at that point? Because it's just, it's going to keep pulling you a place that's at odds with the direction that needs this. to go some communication error has happened in some major way for that to get that bad. Um, but you get what like, I'm asking? How like write... how much of this, how much of this are you deliberately trying to manifest so outwardly that actually the, at some point the playlist itself would have to change mm -hmm. because it's actually, it's actually interfering. It's actually going interfering. Yeah. I mean, that's happened. I think not so much with character building that will happen for my day stuff. So like, if I think this scene is inherently sad, and I've somehow misread what the intentions were, which can, you know, you can sometimes be completely wrong. And they're like, no, 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 it's not that intense. We didn't think it was that big a deal. I'll jettison the song that I had lined up for that day that I would have been using. I'm like, oh, that's not needed. Why do I need to listen to that? But like where like the Midnight Mass Sergio Leone thing came from was, it was simply because I, I, knew, I knew in confidence that <laughs> Flanagan didn't know I was gonna jizz Clint Eastwood everywhere. <laughs> that was that was never discussed. What was discussed was was when he when he pitched it to me and told me what the story was. I was like, hold on, there's this amazing, these two amazing things at war with each other here, right? Because you've got isn't the sheriff, especially in cinema, one of the most iconic American heroes of all time, right? The small town sheriff, mm -hmm. and then isn't the bearded brown Muslim one of the all time greatest villains? Of Classic American hero cinema? archetype, right? <laughs> And I was like, oh, you've smooched them together because he's got, he's that, but he's the sheriff. And, and I, so, so I had said, which I, which, so it was intention. It, it's not fluke. Obviously he was doing that on purpose, but I was like, okay, well, I know this bit does, does the, 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 the Muslim brown guy, bearded guy. How do I get that sheriff bit to translate? And it was through channeling certain poses and just ways that like the old guys would you post like up on it, the thing, hip. Yeah. That's where the music yep. came from, the hips. We, Terry Anderson, our costume designer, who's been our costume designer on most of the stuff, he's awesome. Um, I remember speaking to him about silhouettes because I was like, I don't want the audience to be hit over the head with it. But like, it'd be real nice if it feels familiar without them knowing it's familiar. And, 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 mm. and I was like, how do we make a Wild West outfit look modern without anyone like really realizing we're doing a Wild, wild West? So I was wearing cowboy boots under my jeans. So you could see, I had that silhouette on the leg, but for the front of the boot just looked like any old standard work boot. And then we, we, we settled on the double denim kind of look and, and the copper badge on the outside. Um, so like, I wouldn't have, I might knew it was going that way. I don't, I, I, yeah, I don't think I would misunderstand him that much. Although actually funny enough, Mike and I, I can count like the amount of minutes him and I have had character discussion. And I don't know if that's, that's part of why Mike likes working with me is I, I kind of get it pretty fast. I, I, yeah. And he leaves me a lot. He sort of leaves me to my devices and I come back and I, and I don't shit the bed. Maybe that's why, but like, my first conversation with him for Owen, Bly Manor, um, I'd already auditioned and booked it, so but so I wasn't being met. It was just like, a, hey, welcome to Vancouver, welcome to our show. I think the first thing I said to him was, what's you and McGregor like? Because he had just done Doctor Sleep. <laughs> and then we spent most of the chat doing that. And then he said, do you, how do you feel about the character? I said, I'll do whatever you want. And then I that, that might be our only character meeting. Nice. Leo Usher. I, I remember messaging him. I, mean, after... I think you have ideas really fast. But they're super, yeah, like I'll get a, an instant thing and he'll he'll know immediately to be like, uh-uh, that's wrong. I remember him saying on Usher, I sent him pictures of this model who was tatted up, neck tattoos, hand tattoos, wearing suits and he had like edge, you know, faded hair on the side. And I was like, I'm getting this vibe. And I remember Mike was like, cool, but remember you're not a prick charm he kept saying something to me in text charm don't lose the charm i need you to still be charmed for some reason i wasn't he wanted this sibling to not be I've an out and out charming yeah he didn't want me to be an out and out asshole that was but other than that i, I it wasn't until we shot our first scene and then i just remember him across the room going mm. Andy, and does that's that six kind of months of prep then go on to inform you like how much do the aesthetics of the show inform 
your work in that like are you looking at you know stills of the way that Rahul looks in a scene and does that actually inform the music that you end up writing Definitely. or is it more yeah. about feeling it mm. does so it's the aesthetics we, play a big part too yeah aesthetic yeah it, it all play I think it all plays into like the the vibe of of what's happening you know and, and how that's sort of like brought across musically because it could go so many different directions um and in this case it was kind of like middle of the road like instrumentation wise because the idea was that it would it would be this sort of train in the middle of what's happening and have all the you have all these crazy things happening um and the idea was that the music would sort of just take you through it without being too much of a, like you know without giving you too much feeling i think was the for mm. most of it um is it fair to say that the score was also meant to be a bit of a terra firma since every episode is almost like a short film uh, you know, obviously taking these individual short stories of Edgar Allan Poe and like it obviously has a larger through line as a series, but each one is so, almost standalone. It would be very tempting to musically make them so stylized and unique that it's like eight scores. It felt like the music was actively trying to be the opposite of that. It felt like the score was like, we want you to be one of the few things that feels recurring so that you're not lost Yes, that's exactly that's exactly right. It was sounds like, sounds like you liked it, Austin. That sounds like uh, this is just dispassionate analysis. This was just I'm just calling it for what it is. <laughs> yeah, but that's exactly right. It was like let's hit the let's hit the four basic thematic ideas and have those maintained throughout. You know, like uh, because there's so much going on. I mean, just the way episode two ends is just like oh shit, this is what's this is what's happening. We're gonna really fuck some people up here um so i think that it was uh the in response the to that way. one online has been really fun like we've seen some people do like <coughs> reaction videos to the show where they like watch it and and like react live i guess um oh really and yeah the end of episode two there are all these people being like oh my god yeah. <laughs> like they didn't see it coming it's so brutal so especially i think from from mike even though he's like a horror director like i think it's pretty next people level. are people are always expecting something now emotional emotional and and to see him just be like watch this it's because he's not a gore fest horror yeah it, that's not his you know yeah. it, it's yeah. not like slasher movie kind of stuff you know but he's always just, had that in him right like i feel like he, he can but do it's that a payoff it's it's not a it's not it what i love about his work in general is that um it's an earned thing. It's not just like a stepping stone to the next scene. It's like, oh shit, well, we're at the end of the first act. Someone's got to die or whatever. It's like things like that church <clears throat> mayhem at the end of Midnight Mass mm. is so earned by that point. Like the show, I, I know I mentioned to the other day, but I've spent the last few years telling people that that show is watching someone pull back a bow, like a bow, like his master marksman bow and arrow uh shooter i get whatever the archer, archer. Uh, <laughs> uh uh like take aim for seven episodes um right. and then finally let it loose because it's just tension building in such an extreme uh restrained kind of way that to me is what makes it fly off the rails so well you know it's so it, it's so calculated it's not just like oh fuck the audience is bored let's throw some sure. chaos at them it's never that just completely off topic is this the first play watch listen you've done since austin got grammy nominated? yes which i was going to mention at the end Ooh, ooh, austin <laughs> and grammy and nominated. and technically uh, uh has been i've technically been bragging Marvel about it austin all week to my family <laughs> i'm like any of you lot been nominated for a grammy mm -hmm. or anything no <laughs> You are on a uh, Grammy nominated. Album. I'm on my way to EGOT. Yeah. Technically, you're getting me an EGOT. I, my favorite, uh, my favorite is I have a composer friend named Alan who's like a musical theater guy, and he, he posted a photo once with Alan Menken, and he goes, "Alan Menken, eight-time Oscar winner for all the Disney musicals of the late '80s, early '90s," and he's like. Here's two Allens who write musicals. Between us, we've won eight Oscars. Uh, <laughs> I always thought that was one of the best photo captions. Uh, but uh, Austin, huge yeah. props, Austin. It's yeah, awesome. congrats. Yeah, it's that's huge. It it's uh, well, it's very kind. It it uh, it was yeah, it was it was fun. It was 
you know, obviously Stray Gods. Did you um, get some Game Awards nominations as well? I assume so. I haven't looked at the list. I'm yet, happy but... to say that GameSpot made an entire article out of uh, the 100% snubbing. Uh, oh, no uh, way. It is, it is literally cool, an Jeff. article that. Jeff, uh, I'm so surprised yeah. to hear that. That's nuts. Wow. It, it is. It is. I, I cannot say I was surprised. Um, Game Awards is very like the, the jury is so international and so big that it, it it very much is a biggest marketing budget type thing. They also um, don't know what they're doing. Last year, I had to present Ragnarok with the award for best writing. Right. Bit of a conflict, <laughs> yeah. Right. No, yeah. I didn't mean <laughs> like this is this is the coverage this is i just threw it in the chat this made me this made me laugh that that... Game Awards three gods get... that's so oh funny. we got snubbed because they mentioned that... you get a grammy award but not game awards like i love that, that funny. like theoretically this is an article about the five scores that were nominated the grammys but they 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 make the headline about stray gods because precise but actually the funny thing all five in both are, have zero overlap all five grammy nominees are also not at the game Wait, awards Bear it's, didn't it, get oh that would have been last just year, last it? year yeah. he did last year uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it i have a clip up on twitter i think i might have clipped it on uh twitch as well where rahul and i were playing through the game and react to rahul's song the first time and it's just so much fun the delivery of oh i'm, I'm not, not saying, saying you're fat, fat. <laughs> it's just so good it's incredible um but yeah, I know I, 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 the game awards I, devastatingly. I said it to Austin and Troy, but I was, I, I recorded that at a time where I was very unhappy professionally with a, what some work I was doing, and it was causing it was, it was I was having those questions which I haven't had to ask for a while. You know, like, do you like this? Do you want to keep doing this? Are you fucking even good enough? Do you have fun? Do you care? It was just all of those sorts of things piling on top of me. And um, I, I, I paused filming. I think I flew to LA, and uh, I had the two days with you guys to yeah, do, you to do so... the Minotaur, and I was fucking cracking up. Yeah, you were so happy. Yeah, back to like, and I, I was like, no, you do love it. You just got to, you know, you just, just got to be a Minotaur. Yeah, <laughs> but like, no, it was it was the kind of it was the kind of realization I needed at that moment. I was like, don't let, you know, being. You know, and it's normal. I'm not, you know, if you if you work a lot, and you guys know this, we all do. Like, you're not gonna love everything you do. It's just you're not. It's not possible. Some projects, for me, aren't passion projects. Sometimes they're convenient, or they keep me in so Los I Angeles. Play, watch, listen in general. You know, I just oh, got to do this. Pays the bills. Yeah, right. It's pretty. It's pretty. Mm. Uh, but, it's pretty but, just grind, grind, nose to the grindstone. grind every week, play, watch, listen, out every Friday, never miss. But yeah, like... It, We're it pretty was... pro-crunch culture. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was... Uh, yeah, anyway, it was, one of, it was one of them ones that just snuck up on me. I yeah, didn't realize. I was like, oh, dude, you love this. Don't, you know, don't... Um... But I had the best time. And then, you know, once the song came out and the reception, and I'm so happy I did it. Um, so yeah, you hear that, you Keely? That. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff, we're mates as well. Shall it's I? Not, it shall has I, nothing to do with him. Shall I tell him I'm not presenting any awards this year? Yeah, just text him and say that. He'd be like, Didn't I'm out. Ask. Um, I uh, so, yeah, oh, I, just, I will can just I bring up one last thing. Uh, just has to be quick because we're about to get real noisy. Okay. Uh, also, so Andy, awesome. I'm super excited <laughs> for for Andy and Taylor's project, which has been publicly announced, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. 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 X Men. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I cannot Very wait. Exciting. I am so excited. Like, oh, <coughs> bless you. That I remembered I have another person here. I'm so used to muting when I sneeze. <laughs> Sorry, but um, but yeah, I know you probably can't talk anything about it. But I, every time we're together, I, I want you to play me stuff. But we're psyched yeah, yeah we're super yeah. pumped yeah it's 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 coming soon it's coming very soon oh yeah. sweet but yeah uh andy where can people find you and taylor if they want to find more of your work um we're on all the we're on spotify and apple music and youtube and then we're on uh instagram and twitter and it's it's just the, under the newton brothers um all of our Triplets. stuff triplets. triplets triplets as, triplets, as it will be rebranded off the show. that's right and and Given that this is ostensibly, hypothetically, a video game podcast, we can wrap it all up by also offering congrats to the two of you for 
Five Nights at Freddy's uh, yeah. film adaptation. Yeah. Crushing it, internet, crushing it, period. I started to say internationally, but it's just been a massive it's box huge, office. It probably right? probably yeah. one of Blue Mouse's bigger hits, I would think. Yeah, it's done. I, I, I think... I think it might be one of their bigger, yeah, one of their biggest sort of uh, releases. Like multiple hundreds of millions oh, box yeah. office level hit. Huge property. I so mean. you had Usher and Five Nights come out in the space of like, say, what, two <laughs> weeks? Yeah, and technically, we weren't allowed yeah. to talk about either of them for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was <laughs> like real, ride. just keeping it all real. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of a... Usher, Usher and Five Nights at Freddy's, but can't really celebrate too busy working on X-Men. What a yeah. life, Andy. That's Not bad. Fucking slacker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rahul, where can people find you? Oh, uh, Instagram. Um, it's Rahul Coley 13. It's not particularly interesting. No, it's, that's not true. It's, it's, what we've found great. is is uh, if we respond uh, in uh, slightly provocative manners, you'll screenshot it and offer oh, and, a director's commentary. Back. Great way to get attention, yeah. 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 But I do it because it disappears after 24 hours. And I and um, f for me, it feels like it's not the internet isn't forever. So I'm happy to just um, be a prick in my stories. But I'm very professional on my permanent feed. Mm. That's where you'll see nice behind the scenes stuff. Just in the stories, you're calling people a cunt. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Discrepancy. Because it disappears. <laughs> Rahul, you have to know that Taylor and I talk, your posts and Taylor are so good. We love like... You're just, yeah, what you're doing on social media, Taylor and I talk about it all the time. Taylor will call me up. We'll be talking about it. He's like, you see what Rahul posted? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That's, apparently, I got told when we were doing Bly, it was a bit of a shock for Trevor and Mike because I'm not, I'm not crazy on, like, in when I work, I'm super quiet and respectful. I don't bounce off the walls, but then in my pocket, in the green room, I look, I'm like deranged on social media. And um, I posted on Mike's, I didn't even know Mike that well, but I photoshopped, you know, Demi Moore, Patrick Swayze, the pottery thing. I had put our faces on it and posted it as like to celebrate us collaborating on Bly. And I didn't even earn that. Mm -hmm. And and he, and I was like, you know, some, cause it was ghost related or spooky. And I remember them going, oh, Trevor's being like, that's an interesting that's an interesting thing to do that's uh that's cool um and uh yeah i got super self-conscious about that for, thought about it for six weeks keep but, it up yeah um well yeah, it's about to get very noisy here the the first practice lap is Ooh. a matter of minutes away oh, seriously? Uh, so it's gonna get is it outside loud. your window is it outside uh, your window or near it's nearby i guess so we, we super have, nearby uh, we have paddock passes which I don't they know look amazing them. yeah so these are crazy i i I bought tickets for F1 for Rahul's birthday and because I've been a motorsports fan for forever. Um, and then I messaged EA and was like, hey, by the way, I'm going to the F1 if you need anyone to do anything. And in exchange for doing some stuff with we, EA- We told them I was Grammy nominated. <laughs> <laughs> we got these beautiful passes that like come in these like oh, contain boxes. Wow. Like they're the, the best line you've ever seen. That looks like a phone. <laughs> yeah, it just looks like wild. And there's one each day. So they're all like different Incredible. colors. Um, and these are uh, paddock classes, which they're worth like 20 grand. Like it's, it's absolutely, oh my gosh. yeah. So these That's are like, from like EA? solid steel. Yeah. Uh, oh. thank, very that thankful is. for it. So yeah, the paddock is basically like, I guess the ideal place to go. Um, I'm just super excited. I'm so, so happy to be here. Are you going to the sphere in the meantime? We think we will go to We're the sphere. Yeah. To. yeah. We, we, the, we went to the garages. We can say that, right? That was yeah. We went to the like, actual wild. The just seeing Team Ferrari. I was out, past, I've... Yeah, it's super. Cool. It's very, very cool to be here. It's super exciting. Uh, but it's also a disaster because the strip is all closed. But off. it's crazy when you're like when we got a cab, like you're on the track right now, right? Because all of the the barriers are up. So you're you're because it's still for the for the general public during the day yeah um, which is you... like a really shitty thing about it actually is you know they have all the sky bridges in vegas yeah they've put up barriers to yeah. stop people from watching the races they put up oh, this so like you can't just stand on those and watch yeah they they were they were clear and now they've put on these like stickers to make them so uh, distorted so people can't oh, wow. spectators which yeah. i think is such a shit thing to do yeah like you're in that city, let them watch. Yeah. I guess just where do you, you can see from the sidewalk though? No, that's too dangerous. Yeah, guess, you could right? probably see. I think that they're like they've built them back a little bit, but not too much. There are gonna be people everywhere. Wow, sure. but it looks so 
Like we were in the course today, right? In the cab. It looks so narrow. Yeah, it's nuts. And they're going to be going there at 200 miles an hour. But Vegas it's the most amazing crack. birthday present. Uh, like, Thanks, I only found out like a few days ago. She'd kept yeah. it a secret. And um, yeah. Nice. And she'd been like doing things where <laughs> I was being scheduled for work. And I'd go, yeah, I can do that date. But she knew I couldn't because I uh, we were going to be in Vegas. So she was going behind my back. Yeah, I had to email his manager. She'd contact my manager be like, he's not available for that date. Because he, he forwards he me is. scripts. I had both their emails and I had to be like, he's not available that date. Please don't tell him why. And then they'd come back and go, sorry, productions had to reschedule. And I'd be like, that's fucking unacceptable. <laughs> How, stop mucking me around not knowing that <laughs> they... <laughs> We were going to have you uh, audition for Nolan, but I guess uh, you're too busy uh, <laughs> F1. Too busy at Vegas. <laughs> nice um, work, Alana. Yes. Yeah, anytime. Uh, on that note, thank you for joining us. We could have spoken about this for way longer. I'm sure I still have so much Usher stuff I want to talk about. So I want to sure visit Andy's studio. We've been saying it for yeah, ages. I want to go I'm to... over. Anytime. Group hang. Anytime. You've got yeah. like a cool bar, don't you? I have a great bar here. There's a great bar here. We could, yeah, we should. Let's get Austin. There's three of us. Let's go. In any case, thank you all so much for watching. I'm Alana. That's Rahul. That's Austin. <laughs> That's Andy. There's Austin right here. <laughs> There's Austin. This is Play Watch Listen. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Sorry about the audio.